Hey everyone, welcome into the Fantasy Pros Football Podcast. My name is Kyle Yates and I am your host. I got to start off today's show by saying happy birthday to my co-host, Mike Taglier. Happy birthday, buddy. Thanks, dude. It's a, I mean, as everybody knows, my mom asked me, she goes, what, what are you doing for your birthday this year? And I was just like, what do you think I'm doing, huh? I'm working. I mean, <laughs> it's just another day in the life. I'm, I'm, I'm going to aim to write about 10,000 words today. She goes, I don't write a lot. She's like, but that seems like a lot. I'm like, well, someone's got to do it. Well, I think here's the thing. Some people would sit down and they'd watch like a show on their birthday. We know you. We know that you're going to sit down and watch some film. Mm -hmm. You know, that's going to be your evening entertainment. That's just who, who you are. But hey, you can find both of us on Twitter at KyleYNFL and at Mike Taglier NFL. And you can also find and follow us on Instagram as well at KyleYNFL and at Mike Taglier. I'm excited for today's guest tags. We have Eric Moody with us. He's a staff writer for The Athletic and can be found on Twitter at Eric N. Moody. Eric, thanks for taking some time out of your busy schedule to chat with us. No, I'm, I'm, I do appreciate the invite. Yeah, looking forward to chatting about football. You know, I'm always down for that. You know, things are going pretty good. Uh, I guess if I were doing any better, I'd be a twin. <laughs> All right, guys. Hey, uh, I've got something that I want to talk through before we get into the content of today's show. I just got to ask this question, guys. How awesome would it be if you never had to worry about stressful lineup decisions, forgetting to sub out an inactive player who's a game time decision, spending hours upon hours managing all of your leagues one by one, or using up your Sunday morning doing copious amounts of research for your DFS lineups? Well, guess what, guys? You will never have to deal with any of that ever again when you subscribe as a Hall of Fame member for our site. A six-month Hall of Fame subscription will allow you to literally put all your teams on autopilot and you'll never have to deal with lineup decisions ever again. We use our data to not only swap out your inactive players for you, but also automatically swap in your optimal lineup for each of your fantasy teams. We also have a multi-league assistant that makes managing all your teams a breeze. If you play DFS, then you're in luck because a Hall of Fame subscription also grants you access to our lineup optimizer, daily projections, and the ability to export lineups straight to DraftKings or FanDuel. All this can be had for the rest of the season for just $65. And if you want to try it before you buy it, well, you can for the entire season. We've got a special offer going on right now for six free months of our Hall of Fame package. To claim this offer, all you have to do is head to fantasypros.com offers, make a $10 deposit on Mon Monkey Knife Fight, FanDuel, or DraftKings, and enter a contest. That's it. This offer is only available to brand new users of those sites, so if that's you, then I strongly urge you to claim this offer and make the most of your Fantasy Pros experience. Again, that's fantasypros.com slash offers. All right, guys, we got some news items that I want to touch on before we talk, start, sit, players. We got a lot of content to get through today. So let's just touch on these news items super quick. Philip Lindsay, running back for the Denver Broncos, uh, was looking pretty good in the, in the matchup there on Monday night. He leaves the game early, though. We see Melvin Gordon take on a larger workload. Philip Lindsay dealing with turf toe. He's currently getting a second opinion, but tags turf toe isn't something that you can easily bounce back from, you know, and play the next week. So should we be should we be preparing for a, a week of absence from Phil Lindsay here? Yeah, it seems like it's going to be an IR situation where a lot of teams are starting to use this. IR used to be a six-week thing or a, a full-season thing, uh, whatever, because there was designation to return. But now it's three weeks, so you're, you're seeing guys put on there all the time. Le'Veon Bell was just put on there with a hamstring injury. Richard Sherman was just put on there. Uh, a lot of players are just popping up on there. It's just like save them from themselves. I wouldn't be surprised if Michael Thomas ends up on there, to be honest. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to uh, assume that Philip Lindsay is going to miss at least three weeks, which means Melvin Gordon is going to be the workhorse running back there. Unfortunately, the matchup he gets this week against Pittsburgh, well, I mean, everybody saw Saquon Barkley on Monday night against that team. It's it's going to be a, a tough go for him, but uh, over the next three weeks, he should be a guaranteed 18-plus touches per week. Uh, the next news item here is the 49ers signed Mohamed Sanu. They are in desperate need of wide receiver help. Eric, Debo Samuel's on IR. Again, Tags mentioned the, the uh, sp specifications there with IR this year, but with them signing Mohamed Sanu, is this someone that you're really even looking at for fantasy purposes? Yeah, it is a situation that I was intrigued by, just given you know Shanahan's relationship with Sanu during their time, like in Atlanta. And so it's a nice pickup. You know, it makes sense. You know, he's not someone that I would recommend to aggressively target, like in fantasy, unless you're in a really, really deeper format. Because the reality is, you know, this offense flows through uh, George Kittle. But hey, you know, if you're in a 14, 16 team plus league, it's worth taking a flyer on Sanu. 
It's a fair point, yeah, and, and there are concerns now with George Kittle coming back from a potential knee sprain, I think is what it was diagnosed as, so there's a potential here for Sanu, but he's not really someone that I'm looking at uh, in a 12-team or smaller format. Um, the big news item here, guys, though, Michael Thomas, injured here, high ankle sprain, turns out to be a little bit worse than what we were expecting. He's now expected to miss several weeks, which is not a good sign, especially for people, fantasy managers who drafted him in the first round, right? That's where he was going, potentially even with a top four pick. So now this Saints offense has to move forward without Michael Thomas. Tags, what are the fantasy implications here for the Saints offense? Do we see them lean a little bit more on the running game? Yeah, it's going to have to. I think Latavius Murray is a guy that we talked about flex consideration most weeks, and I think it's going to be even more viable moving forward. Uh, they're, they're playing on Monday night this week, so don't expect to have Michael Thomas. I Again, I think that he's going to wind up on the IR list because you have to save him from himself. He's a guy that he probably wants to push to play through injury, but this team needs to think about the long term, and if he further aggravates it, it's going to continue to bother him all season so I fully anticipate him missing at least two weeks maybe three weeks so uh, Emmanuel Sanders is going to step into a bigger role Traquan Smith is going to have to but as we saw last week I mean Michael Thomas wasn't a big factor in that game Jared Cook was the one who saw a lot of tough uh, you know uh, targets funnel his way knowing that Drew Brees is getting up there in age his arm strength is deteriorating a little bit I think we're going to continue to see Jared Cook as a consistent fantasy producer especially against his old team this week so um, Traquan Smith if you're looking for a deep ad I think he's a guy that should probably see four to six targets per game and you know he's done well on a per target basis over the course of his career Eric let's touch on Jared Cook here super quick because I do agree with tags that he's the main beneficiary we've talked with Dan Harris about Emmanuel Sanders who he has ranked as a top 10 option right uh no but with Emmanuel Sanders potentially moving up into wide receiver 30 range throughout the time that Michael Thomas will miss but I agree with tags I was going through my projections Jared Cook seems to be the main beneficiary here how high does he go with this, like, let's just talk about for the next few weeks, let's assume Michael Thomas misses three weeks. Where are you going to be ranking Jared Cook from a tight end perspective? Yeah, Jared Cook, you know, that's an intriguing name, you know, especially considering, you know, how he performed against the Bucks. I know it wasn't a ton of offense, you know, with the Saints, you know, against the Buccaneers. I know he did catch, you know, five of seven targets, you know, for 80 yards uh, in the Saints uh, win. When I think about Cook, you know, moving forward, because losing Michael Thomas, oh my goodness, that's a you know, that that's huge but you know I do see him being involved uh, even more uh, along with Emmanuel Sanders Tra- uh, Traquan Smith but it is going to be kind of like a committee you know they're all going to band together to replace uh, his production but the reality is just given how dire the tight end situation is outside of the big three I'm like I believe he's a top eight option I agree with that uh, I I was just shocked I don't know how the heck Jared Cook at 34 years old now continues to average 16 yards per reception but it happens and so I think he's absolutely going to produce as long as Michael Thomas is out of the lineup he's going to see a significant number of targets all right last or right, we got two more here excuse me so Denzel Mims placed on IR New York Jets wide receiver again IR is a little bit different he could come back in three weeks but you're now looking at Chris Hogan Brashad Perryman and Jamison Crowder as the main options in a a terrible Jets offense that loses Le'Veon Bell too. We didn't even mention that. So Le'Veon Bell out a few weeks. Jamison Crowder, I put this out on Twitter earlier, tags, uh, someone convinced me that Jamison Crowder isn't going to see a 45% target share this week. I just can't see a way that this doesn't happen. I don't know. They're they're probably going to be missing two of their top three cornerbacks in this game. And the, uh, both of them are perimeter options. Kiwan Williams is their slot guy. He's actually been pretty solid in coverage. So they could try and lead on like someone like Brashad Perriman a little bit. I expect them. I, I think Chris Herndon uh, potentially has a big week here because Williams it has been pretty stable in the slot. So I understand the thought process behind this. I really do. And I think he will get targets. But I think Chris Herndon is someone that I think I'm a little bit more excited considering the other options we have at wide receiver. Yeah, and and just to put that into context, I'm saying that, you know, somewhat tongue in cheek, but yet, you know, I'm not putting I'm not ranking Jamison Crowder as a top ten wide receiver this week or anything like that. I haven't met like twenty eight, I think, in my rankings. You showed me earlier he was thirteen. I'm kidding. Yeah, I mean, it's just, (laughs) yeah, yeah. Uh, (laughs) No, (laughs) it's just crazy. I mean, I was looking at, I'm like, I don't even know where, I don't feel comfortable giving Chris Hogan or Brashad Perryman a significant number of targets. So Chris Herndon, definitely for sure, though. Uh, The main one here that broke just right, uh, right before we started recording, Chris Godwin placed in the concussion protocol today. So this is not great news when it happens this late in the, in the week. So Uh, He took a big shot apparently at the end of the Saints game, and that has placed him into concussion protocol. The game is on Sunday here for the Carolina Panthers and Tampa Bay Buccaneers. It's not looking great for Chris Godwin. Uh, Eric, let's just assume that Godwin is out for this matchup. Do you look at someone like Scotty Miller? 
Yeah, you you have to look at someone like Scotty Miller. Um, like if Godwin truly misses the game, which we're trending that direction, of course. I'm like Scotty Miller. I'm like he's on the wide receiver three, you know, radar. You have to think about the competition that he's uh, playing against. And Carolina Panthers, they really didn't show much last week, right? So you know, he's a surefire wide receiver three, in my opinion. I like that call. All right, guys, let's move into the main content for today. Of course, we're talking start sit. So let's start out the conversation here with the top starts per position. We're going to look at the running backs first, and we're looking basing this off of our ECR, which stands for expert consensus rankings. It takes all the rankings of experts across the industry, puts them together and gives an average, right? So let's look at these running backs that are outside the top 20 in half PPR ECR. And let's identify a player that we think is an absolute start this week. Tags will go to you, then to Eric, and then I'll finish it up. I'm going with Ronald Jones this week. I know a lot of people are going to be scared to start him, uh, but this news on Chris Godwin is only going to further him up my board. I would have had him ranked as a top 20 running back before this injury uh, with Chris Godwin, but if Godwin's out, this team's going to rely on the run more than ever. They're going to run a lot of two tight end sets. They're going to have plenty of blockers in there. Ronald Jones, is uh, he played 33 snaps uh, last week compared to Leonard Fournette's nine snaps, and by all accounts, Ronald Jones looked fantastic. Touched the ball 19 times, was involved in the passing game. Uh, he saved Tom Brady from an underthrown ball. Uh, there was a lot of reasons and then you go up against Carolina a team that uh, I've gone over their last six games they've played there has not been a single backfield that's totaled fewer than 29 touches against them so even if you want to give Leonard Fournette 10 touches I don't care um he's going to I, I think Ronald Jones is in line for 20 touches this week against the Carolina defense that's just been smashed like they've been obliterated um they couldn't do anything to stop Josh Jacobs last week and that's why he ran for three touchdowns so um Ronald Jones I don't know why he's outside the top 20. I'll agree with that. I I mean, multiple scores are in the cards here for Ronald Jones in this matchup. So, Eric, what do you think about Ronald Jones here? Is he someone that you're considering starting as well? Yeah, that was one name that uh, that immediately came to mind. I'm like, you look at what Jones, you know, was able to do, you know, in the in the game against the Saints for the Buccaneers. You know, solid game just given the circumstances. But one thing that was that I noticed, I would say, was that, you know, he dominated the touches, you know, in the Tampa Bay backfield. You look at Leonard Fournette, LaShawn McCoy, they combined for just seven touches, you know, for 19 yards. And so you look at the matchup, you know, again, it's all about the matchup, you know, the Panthers. You know, they allowed a monster fantasy performance, you know, to Josh Jacobs, but this even extends back into last season. You know, Alvin Kamara, Marlon Mack, Chris Carson, Devontae Freeman all had superb performances against them in PPR. Like all those running backs and Jacobs combined averaged 20 touches, 105 total yards, and 24 PPR fantasy points per game. So I do agree with Tags for wow. where we're looking at someone that's on the running back one radar potentially. That's the kind of ceiling that Jones is going to bring you. And another thing, too, that uh, Tags didn't bring up is that you look at Jones. You know, he is very explosive. You know, he generated 31.5% of his rushing yards on attempts that gained more than 15 yards last season. So I am all in on Ronald Jones. And I have another name, too, whenever I'm up. <laughs> Let's go. Let's just turn it right back to you, brother. Let's go. Uh, who's that running back for you outside the top 20? Yeah, well, one guy that uh, caught my attention in addition to Jones was uh, J.K. Dobbins. You know, he only rushed for 22 yards, two touchdowns on seven rushing attempts against the Browns. You know, it's nothing that's necessarily going to get you overly excited, but there are some other things that you should consider uh, when you're looking at Dobbins uh, for this week. I'm like, he did force, you know, one missed tackle, you know, on those six attempts and finished with 2.2 yards after contact, if you look at pro football focus. But no Ravens running back saw more than 39% of Baltimore's offensive snaps. Now, Here's the reality. You know, Mark Ingram does not have a stranglehold on the opportunities in the Ravens' backfield. I know many were really intoxicated by his performance last season, finishing as the RB11 in PPR formats, but here's the reality. It's difficult for Ingram to replicate his 2019 fantasy finish during his age 30 season. You know, you look at all the different statistics, you know, breakout age, peak age, etc. I'm like, the data's there. But it does appear that the Ravens want to use Dobbins as their goal line guy. And his usage, you know, shouldn't come as a surprise. You know, this is someone that was drafted in the second round of this year's draft. And even offensive coordinator Greg Roman mentioned in August that the team would rotate running backs every week. So he's going to see numerous opportunities, you know, in the red zone. And he's got a really good uh, matchup, you know, against the Texans. So, you know, again, this is someone that can be viewed as an upside running back three, in my opinion. Tags, let's just turn that right back to you. Obviously, we just saw Clyde Edwards Hilaire destroy this Houston Texans, you know, defense and run defense, particularly with 25 carries and averaging 5.5 yards per carry. So is Dobbins someone that if he 
it all comes down to for me if he gets the goal line back absolutely or the goal line work excuse me absolutely fire him up mm -hmm. Well, yeah, that's the thing. I don't know if we can guarantee it, though. That game was so out of hand last week uh, against Cleveland. Cleveland didn't even put up a fight. Uh, it wasn't even a game the entire time, and Dobbins walked away with seven touches in that game. It worries me a little bit because this is a team last year that did preserve Mark Ingram for much of the year, and they really weren't using him in high-volume situations, especially when they pulled away in games. So I'm still thinking that this is a Mark Ingram backfield where J.K. Dobbins will be mixed in. They're still going to use Gus Edwards a little bit. Uh, Justice Hill was inactive last week. I mean, there are three running backs in this backfield field that are going to get touches regardless and I think that we expect them to win this game so even if we say that Dobbins finishes with 10 touches I don't know if he's a guaranteed must start and I can't say for with any certainty that he's going to get all goal line work but I will say if you look at the Texans uh, basically they lost DJ Reader up the middle uh, this offseason that's a massive blow to them uh, that's why they couldn't stop Clyde Edwards Solaire last week so if they rack up the touches here which they really should um, I could see Dobbins being a factor I think he's a little bit more risk reward like a back end RB three but I could definitely see him getting in there if you know like what Eric said if he, if he gets those go if he has that goal line role he's going to be a lot more valuable because Mark Ingram basically finished as an RB1 last year based on his touchdowns not based on the amount of carries he got for sure all right the guy that I will bring up here guys I'm going a little bit further down you guys mentioned Ronald Jones at uh, RB22 in ECR JK Dobbins at RB24 so a lot of experts are with you Eric saying that Dobbins is someone that they're absolutely excited about this week this may be cheating a little bit because of the Michael Thomas news, but I'm going all the way down to RB38, guys. I'm mentioning Latavius Murray. Tags talked about him that this is someone who now moves into weekly, you know, RB2 potentially consideration in my eyes. With looking at the New Orleans Saints offense, this offense ran through Michael Thomas. And we can say that, yes, you know, the, the previous game, they didn't look his way a ton. And they spread the ball around quite a bit. But yet, they still didn't throw the ball a ton. Now... If you can say that they're taking away Michael Thomas and now defenses are going to be able to focus in on Emmanuel Sanders, potentially even focus in on Jared Cook, let's lean on the run game. Like, let's lean on this run game that Las Vegas just saw Christian McCaffrey score twice on him, and now the defenses have to deal with Alvin Kamara and Latavius Murray. So I think Murray is a solid bet to see 15 to 18 carries in this game, potentially even seeing some more work through the air because of Michael Thomas's absence. So I think that he absolutely has top 24 upside this week, potentially even moving into a top 12 finish if he scores. So I think that Latavius Murray is someone that people absolutely need to be considering. Tags, I'll throw this to you first. Like, what do you think here about this call with Latavius Murray? Do you think he's someone that you would be considering starting? I love it. I mean, I have not written up that game just yet, but I do know that if you look at the Raiders last year, they allowed the seventh most fantasy points per opportunity to running backs. So if there's opportunity to be had for Latavius Murray, he's going to score some points. Uh, they did really, really struggle with running backs through the air. So I'm guessing Alvin Kamara is going to smash. But again, yep. Kamara might be used in more of a receiver role. They may have both of these guys in the field at the same time, line up Kamara in the slot, get him the ball on screens or whatever they have to do without Mike. Thomas so uh, Latavius is certainly going to be higher for me than number 38 where he's at in consensus right now and that could be you know people taking time to catch up and be basically of you know Michael Thomas is not going to play because some people were were ridiculously optimistic about Michael Thomas saying he's going to be fine he'll play through it and this and that he, Michael Thomas was never going to play through a high ankle injury if that's what it was so but Yates I am really confused why you did not bring up David Montgomery He's at 27 um, against the Giants, and he looked fantastic last week. This is a Giants team that, did. I mean, everything, all correlation that you have with running backs, it amounts to you want a, a running back that's at home, ideally. Well, it doesn't make as much difference anymore. Right, um, with the fans. Right, but they're big, they're big favorites in this game, too. I think they're favored by five and a half points. Um, yep. The pass rush for the Giants looked a little bit better under Joe Judge last week, so I would assume after watching Benny Snell do what he did to this team and on six days rest, I think the Bears should be attacking with David Montgomery. I think so as well. I, I wanted to go a little bit more bold there uh, and go in Latavius Murray all the way down at RB38. He was someone who jumped off the page, but David Montgomery, absolutely. Yet I, my thoughts on him have been clear all offseason, and he looked fantastic. People wanting to say, like, you know, on Twitter, throwing back at me, like, 3.5 yards per carry incoming. Like, no, this dude averaged 4.9 yards per carry uh, coming off of a groin injury. He looked fantastic. So, Eric, what do you think there about David Montgomery? Do you like that call against this Giants defense? 
No, I really do. And I also like your Latavius Murray call as well, just considering, you know, how the Saints have, you know, heavily leaned on the um, on the running back position in the uh, Sean Payton regime. But Montgomery, yeah, that was that was someone that I uh, did have on my, on my radar. I'm like, if, if just someone, a, a casual fantasy fan, just looks at the stat line, you know, 64 yards, 13 carries, it is a lot more to that. To you, to your point, he played through a groin injury, didn't appear to suffer any setbacks. The, the workload was very encouraging, you know, just given the negative game script. I'm like, he did look good running the ball. I'm like, he averaged, you know, 3.54 yards after contact per attempt. Uh, one thing that, that was not brought up, which I'll bring up because I'm an ex-offensive lineman, so, you know, I'm an offensive line guy, is that I, I like some of the changes that Juan Castillo uh, yeah. made with this unit. You know, I was very excited to see that he was hired, and it gave me some confidence that thinking, okay, he could turn this offensive line around, you know, just given his uh, – you know, NFL body of work and, you know, whatnot. I think it's 20 plus years of experience. But uh, Montgomery does have an opportunity to go boom uh, in week two, you know, against the Giants. You know, that, that's a group that's allowed, you know, 17 touches, 101 total yards, you know, one touchdown and 19 PPR fantasy points per game, you know, to top running back scores over their last five games. So that's a guy that's uh, on the RB2 radar with potentially upside for more. Tags, we got to get Eric back on the podcast more often, dude. He's all, he's got, quoting off some offensive line coaches here. This is amazing. Mm-hmm. So, all right, so Tags, let's put this let's put this to the test here, and let's look at some of these players before we move over to our sits. So, Tags, I'm going to throw this to you. You mentioned Ronald Jones is your guy, so I'm assuming he's the main guy here. But let's just throw all these guys are back to back to back to back in ECR. You have to start one of them, okay? okay. Melvin Gordon. Ronald Jones, Devin Singletary, or J.K. Dobbins is Ronald Jones still your answer? Oh, 100 percent. It's not even that close for me. Cool. Okay, so then Eric, you mentioned J.K. Dobbins there, so I uh, obviously, but let's David Montgomery's right in that range. So pick one out of this group: J.K. Dobbins, Zach Moss, David Montgomery, or James White. And again, in half PPR. Yeah, in half PPR, I would go with uh, David Montgomery there, you know, because I, I feel a lot more comfortable about the opportunities that he would get uh, in that game. Plus, it's a really good matchup. Yeah, I think it. An interesting conversation there would be if you have the flex spot to be able to start J.K. Dobbins and hope that he goes off then I think you can roll him in, right? But if you need like a consistent RB2, someone who you know is going to get the workload, I think David Montgomery is probably the smarter play in that instant. Okay, guys, let's move over to the top sits per position, okay? So we're looking at the top one through 20. Oh, no, I'm sorry, guys. We haven't even done wide receivers. Oh, my goodness, <laughs> I'm jumping ahead. Okay. No worries. Uh, You're excited. <laughs> uh, yeah, I got way too excited. Um, let's go wide receivers here at the top starts per position. Again, this one we're going to look outside the top 30, okay? So the top 30 at wide receivers. Let's try to move through through these a little bit quicker. Tags, who is your wide receiver here for your top start? Deontay Johnson. Uh, play him. I, I don't know what else to say. Uh, he, rookie season, 18% of target share. Uh, that number went to 31.3% in his first full game with uh, Ben Roethlisberger. Uh, you know, the, the Broncos not only had a bad secondary to begin with, but lost A.J. Boye. He's not going to play this week, which means that there's going to be either one, Bryce Callahan, who's a slot cornerback covering him, or rookie Michael I don't even want to pronounce his last name. Michael O. Oh, Oja from There Ola, you go. Iowa. That's what we're going to call yeah. him. Um, we saw Corey <laughs> Davis basically run the same exact route against this team and continually just burn them over and over and over again. Um, that's because A.J. Boye wasn't on him. So it's like, you know, Deontay Johnson's one of the finesse route runners in this league, and that's why we like him. Getting that target share from Ben. I mean, he started off the game rough last week, but, geez, I, this guy is going to be an every week start, start in fantasy. Absolutely. I completely agree. And I, w- I was talking about it on the recent podcast that Dan and I did together tags. Let, like I was terrified the first half. I was like, I've been recommending Deontay Johnson. And if he has another like De- Dante Moncrief situation <laughs> here where <laughs> he gets targeted and just can't come up with a ball, I was going to lose my mind. So I was super happy to see him turn around in the second half. Eric, let's go to you here. Who is your guy that you're identifying as a top start outside the top 30 wide receivers? Yeah. CD lamb for me. I'm like, he was solid in his first NFL game. Uh, just given the circumstances in the matchup, you know, with the Rams, uh, I did like to see his number of snaps uh, be very close to Amari Cooper and Michael Gallup. You know, it was nice to see him start off in the slot. I know he had phenomenal, you know, career numbers when lined up in the slot at Oklahoma, like 52 receptions, 1,085 receiving yards, 12 touchdowns. And here's the reality. You know, the Cowboys had 190 vacated targets uh, entering the season. 
obviously with the loss, you know, of Blake Jarin, uh, you know, you hate to see a guy, you know, like that have a seasoning, a season ending injury, excuse me. But uh, there's going to be plenty of targets to feed all three of these guys. So I really do love Lamb uh, this week. He has a really good matchup against the Falcons secondary. And uh, he's in a gr- great position to go boom. I completely agree. This Tags and I have talked about this matchup could easily hit the over. This is going to be a shootout, like start everyone that you can. And then not even taking, that's not even taken into account. The fact that Blake Jarwin is leaving, uh, you know, with his season ending injury, of course, like you mentioned, we hate to see that, but then they're replacing him with Dalton Schultz. Dalton Schultz is not going to walk in and command the target share that Blake Jarwin potentially could have. So CeeDee Lamb absolutely could go off in this game. And I like Dak a lot in this game too. So, um, all right, Ty, or I'm going to bring up my guy. Uh, that's Jamison Crowder. You know, and I mentioned it just based on the fact that, yes, Richard Sherman is now out on IR. Uh, Akella Witherspoon is potentially, uh, he's in concussion protocol. Again, these are 49ers corners. Uh, yes, the, the corner matchup there isn't fantastic, but yet the ball has to go somewhere. Mm-hmm. And in this offense, Jamison Crowder is the main guy. Looking at, you know, Frank Gore is not, not going to command targets out of the backfield. They brought in Kalen Balaj, who is going to be involved in this game. Like, <laughs> nope. So, you know, looking at Chris Hogan, Brashad Perryman, those are dart throws at best. Jamison Crowder could be easily, could easily see 13 targets again this game. He has the potential. If he can break off one big play like he did last week, even if he doesn't, he can easily return value on where he's being, you know, play, ranked uh, by the experts right now, which is wide receiver 36. I think he can finish within the top 30. So Jamison Crowder here for me. Let's put it to the test, though, for you guys. Uh, let me list off a couple of names here. Tags, let's just not even let's not even focus on the guy that you mentioned. But again, outside the top 30 here. So John Brown, Jamison Crowder, C.D. Lamb and Anthony Miller. Out of those four, who would you be looking to start? John Brown. And of course, this is we he's diagnosed with a foot injury i guess or mispracticed today with a foot injury so let's not even take that into account just for right now let's just say because we don't have clarity john brown jameson crowder cd lamb and anthony miller john brown was last to them before the foot injury so it wouldn't be him uh it would be between lamb and crowder uh it really depends on what you're looking for if you're looking for a safe floor if you feel like hey i have so much upside in my lineup i just need a floor i think crowder's the play there because i i I worry about his team having like an 18 point team implied total that's always worrisome because that means touchdowns are going to be hard to come by but he comes with a solid floor because he's going to get to all those targets now lamb on the other hand that team is going to score some friggin points i mean they're probably going to put up 30 on the board against the falcons but the question is there's so many options in this Falcon or on this uh, Cowboys offense that they can go. The matchups on the perimeter for them between AJ Terrell and Isaiah Oliver, like Julio Jones and Calvin Ridley can wreck. Like if they want to go for 200 yep. yards a piece, they could do that. Um, you know, and then you go to the Cowboys or uh, the Cow. I'm I'm in Amari Cooper and uh, Michael Gallup. I love both of those guys this week. I think they're fantastic. But Lamb is a guy they're still easing in. It's still just his second NFL game. I think there's just so many different pancakes in that level where it's like you have to choose the syrup that goes over the top. And we're going to talk about Dak Prescott uh, in the DFS show. I think it's great to stack these guys in DFS. But in season long, you have to understand the risk reward that you're going to get with Lamb. I think it's possible that he has another game like he had in week one where it's like it wasn't terrible. You know, what is it? Five catches for 56 yards or whatever it was. Um, but there is a ceiling to be had here where if you chase it, Lamb would be the one I would go with of those. So it's it's really close between those two guys. Just depends on what you want. For sure. For sure. Okay, Eric, let's let's put you to the test here. Uh, the names I'm going to list here, Julian Edelman, Jarvis Landry, who is a reportedly going to play tomorrow night, uh, Emmanuel Sanders, and Deontay Johnson. Julian Edelman, Jarvis Landry, Emmanuel Sanders, and Deontay Johnson. Which out of those group of guys would you say has to be a must start? Yeah, for me, it's uh, Deontay Johnson. Uh, yeah, I mean, he ended up getting 10 targets, you know, in week one, uh, you know, caught six of them. I know most of his production came in the second half, you know, so he had a little bit of a slow start. But again, it's that matchup, you know, going against uh, Denver's defense and secondary. Johnson all the way. I love it. And especially, too, when you take into account that Big Ben, I mentioned this with Dan, right? Like, Big Ben looked like a 38-year-old quarterback who hadn't played football in a year, right? So he he warmed up towards the second half. He looked a little bit better, more in sync with his receivers. So that should only help moving forward. I love Deontay Johnson this week. Okay, let's move over to the quarterback position, guys. Again, we're talking about our must-starts here. So outside the top 11, okay, so the top 11 quarterbacks – who is someone that you're identifying as a start this week? Tags, I'll start with you. Uh, I mean, it's your dude, Cam Newton. <laughs> there we go. I, I mean, 
I, I'm willing to admit when I'm wrong, and I was worried about Cam Newton's rushing upside in this offense and what they were going to use him as. I figured he would run, but 15, 15 runs for 75 yards and two touchdowns? I mean, come on. He actually looks like he lost weight from his Carolina days, which is probably good. I mean, he's not he wasn't he didn't look clunky at all. Uh, I know he's 31 years old, but uh, this team, I mean, it's going to be a different game against Seattle, but they have one of the weakest front sevens in the league. They're going to blitz him a lot. And basically, if Cam breaks that first line of defense, he could be off to the races. And, right. you know, they're leaving their cornerbacks in a really bad spot with the blitzes that they do, but they don't really have a choice right now because they're just not generating any pressure with the front four. So, um, yeah, I, I think Cam Newton's a, a safe QB1. I think, too, if Russell Wilson can take control of this defense, which I think is absolutely possible, I don't think there's anyone in the league right now that can slow down Russell Wilson in the way that he's looking. So this game could turn into a shootout, mm -hmm. which means that you know New England might have to even throw the ball more, which could help Newton's uh, overall numbers as well. Eric, let's turn it over to you. Who is a quarterback that you're looking at outside the top 11 here? Yeah, I know one quarterback that, that came to mind quickly was, uh, was Ben Roethlisberger. Was he outside of that range for ECR? Yeah, yep. uh, he yep. was. He's yeah. in thirteen. He was. That's a good one. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I was just. I, I was surprised really to see him. Uh, see him rank there. I, I kind of had to do a uh, do a double take. Uh, I just think with a quarterback like Roethlisberger, you know, you look at their statistical body of work. Uh, even if you go back, you know, ten years, you know, from two thousand eight to twenty eighteen, like this is a guy that's averaged you know twenty fantasy points per game, and it's finished as a QB two or better if my memory serves me right, around like 86 or 87 uh, percent, you know, so his production's phenomenal. Then you look at the weapons that he has, you know, Juju, he's got Deontay Johnson, you know, he's got Eric Ebron, who's, you know, I guess we're kind of his BFF or, you know, best friends, whatever that acronym is, you know, during this uh, <laughs> off season. So they've built a rapport in the COVID environment. And so I think he's another tight end that can go boom uh, for this week too, that's criminally underrated. So I do like the matchup and uh, to your points earlier for where it did get Big Ben, you know, he needs a little time to get going, but I think he's going to be adequately warmed up for week two and ready to go. Yeah, and this Denver defense, right, when you think about it instantly, you're like, ooh, that doesn't sound like a matchup. That's a pretty good defense. But then you're considering Von Miller out, A.J. Bouye out, you know, and Bradley Chubb still coming back from his injury. Jarrell Casey looked great. But outside of that, it's just kind of – it's not a top tier unit without Von Miller on the field is what I'm trying to say. So I think it is a defense that can be exploited and Ben Roethlisberger absolutely can finish within the top 10 again. Uh, Tags, you took my guy. Of course, I was going to mention Cam Newton. That felt like cheating for him to be <laughs> still at 12. Uh, that was someone that I was like, yeah, he needs to be higher than that. I'm having a problem finding, you know, pulling him outside my top five this week, guys. So might be a little bit aggressive on Cam Newton there, but the way that he looked and his involvement in this offense, it's going to be hard. The other name that I'll throw out, if I can't mention Cam Newton, is Ryan Tannehill. Ryan Tannehill throwing the ball 43 times last week uh, and going up against this Jacksonville Jaguars defense. I think Derrick Henry is in line for a huge day, mm -hmm. which only helps out Ryan Tannehill and his efficiency. So again, in a matchup where if this is, this is one thing, Tags, I was going to talk to you about too. I don't remember the Tennessee Titans offense being that fast paced last year. Right. Like they were moving. Yep. Like they came up to the line and they ran they ran a lot of plays in comparison to what they ran last year. So I don't know if that was specific for this week uh, in this matchup, this previous matchup. But if that is a sign of what's to come moving forward, there's going to be a lot more fantasy opportunity in this offense than we yep. originally well, anticipated. By, com by so comparison, last year they ran 59 plays per game. Um, that's that's it. That's that's terrible. That's like Adam Gase level type plays um 78 plays on uh, monday night yeah yeah i like that so ryan Tannehill against this jacksonville jaguars defense again they showed great against philip rivers but that's philip rivers at this point of his career i think ryan Tannehill is a better quarterback than philip rivers at 39 years old so <laughs> ryan Tannehill here would be the guy and he's at 19 in qb ecr right now i think he can be considered a streaming option this week all right, guys, let's finish this up with the tight ends at the starts per position. Again, let's just go lightning round here. Let's just mention who we're thinking and give a quick analysis here outside the top 11. So who is a tight end outside the top 11 that you're considering to be a start? Oh, uh, you did 11. You said 10 on the sheet, which made me I was I was definitely going with Dallas Goddard. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you have Goddard, you're going to play him, right? Like I right. Yeah. Where is God Goddard's up at eight yeah. now? Oh, he is on my sheet. Yeah, um, Goddard moved up. 
Oh well, that sucks. Um, yeah, I was gonna I was gonna go with him, but I'll I will go with my alternative one that I had down was T.J. Hawkinson. Uh, what he did against the Bears last week, they they were a team that allowed just two tight ends to top fifty yards last year. There were Zach Ertz and Travis Kelsey. He caught all five of his targets for fifty six yards and a touchdown. Um, yeah, with Kenny great. Galladay being banged up, we don't even know if he's gonna play. Um, if Galladay right. doesn't play, the targets have to go somewhere. And over the middle of the field, after losing uh, Tremont Williams this off season, uh, I do believe that T.J. Hawkinson should be started as a tight end one. I like that call. Eric, what about you? Who's the guy here that you're looking at? Yeah, Logan Thomas for me. You know, he had a solid game you know, in week one. That was an ugly game to watch, by the way, against the Eagles. <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> quick side note, I was like, my goodness, this is this is hideous. But uh, but anyway, I digress. Yeah. So one thing with, with Logan Thomas, you know, I do see him being a, a key contributor you know, in Washington's offense. Uh, you know, with uh, Dwayne Haskins uh, under center. Uh, the reality is, I'm like the training camp hype you know, from the coaching staff was, uh, was justified. Plus he gets a plus matchup against the Cardinals defense that, you know, has a history of allowing a plethora of monster games to opposing tight ends. So he's my guy. Yeah, for sure. I'm a little concerned. Like, well, I'll just say this, like the, the ball has to go somewhere, right? And that is the, the thing in Logan Thomas's favor. So yeah, he's a tight end 22 in uh, half PPR ECR right now. So going down the list a little bit there, I think he has to score. That's the part that I was going to mention. I'm a little concerned about. I think he has to score for you to feel confident putting him in over some of these other names, but I, I like the call there. He definitely has a good shot of doing that. Hayden Hurst is my guy guys here at uh, just outside that range. I mean, Hayden Hurst going up against Dallas that lost Leighton Van Der Esch at the linebacker position. And then we just got news before we started recording that Sean Lee, their linebacker is expected to miss several weeks as well. So Jalen Smith is going to be, you know, guarding him potentially, you know, that main matchup or they bring down one of their safeties. But I mean, again, this offense, and this game particularly, this is going to be a high-scoring affair. Hayden Hurst, I think, may have disappointed some fantasy owners in week one. I think you should turn right back around and plug him back into your lineup. I like him this week. Okay, guys, now we move over to the top sits <laughs> per position. Let's go to the running back. Who is someone tags in the top 20 that you are saying, I want to sit them if I can? I mean, Melvin Gordon is someone that I, I do want to sit, even if Philip Lindsay is out. Um, it's really difficult for me to like them against like him against the Steelers. I told people last uh, last week that Saquon Barkley was in a really tough spot, and uh, last year there was just one running back all season, just one that topped 14 PPR points against the Steelers defense. This is not just the Giants' problem. This is a Pittsburgh Steelers are really freaking good against the run problem. And uh, Melvin Gordon, I, I know he's using the passing game a little bit, but when you're talking about a top 20 running back that's ranked in the ECR, these are a bunch of smart people that are ranking these guys. That obviously you have to fade someone who's expected to get volumes. So you have to go against the grain and say, I expect this guy to be highly inefficient with the volume that he does get. And uh, it seems like every single running back that goes up against them struggles with that. Um, so and Gordon went uh, against this defense last year. He was with the Chargers at that point, but he ran uh, for just 18 yards on eight carries. So, um, yeah, Melvin Gordon, someone I'd fade if I could. Yeah, that's that's impor the important thing to keep in mind here is that when we're identifying these players, we're saying that if you can't afford to sit them, right? And we're not saying that they're going to finish outside the top 40. We're not projecting that or anything right. like that. But just saying we have to talk about someone in the top 20. And in comparison, you know, Tags, if you have the, the option of Melvin Gordon or Ronald Jones, I think you're saying that you're going to start Ronald Jones. Absolutely. Yep. Right. Okay, cool. So, Eric, let's turn it back over to you. Who is someone in the top 20 that you're sitting at the running back position? Yeah, and I, I do agree with, with uh, tags, you know, about uh, Melvin Gordon. I know that was one name that really kind of struck out to me. But, you know, I'll, I'll kind of be a little little controversial here, and I'll go with another one that I do have some concerns on, and that would be uh, Chris Carson. Uh, and, you know, Chris Carson. You know, I think about, um, you know, the situation, you know, that he's in. Uh, you think about the Patriots. I'm like, they, you know, held Miami's running backs to 69 yards in week one. I'm like, they were the league's, you know, top run D a year ago, uh, even mm -hmm. allowing just one rushing score in the entire regular season. Now, one thing that could change, uh, at least Carson's outlook, if this continues, <laughs> is uh, him being used as a receiver out of the backfield, which I guess he was trying to do his best Christian McCaffrey impersonation. Uh, you know, with all those uh, receptions and touchdowns, but, right. but he's a guy that um, you know you would, on the surface, think is a lock. But there, there, there are some concerns there where he may underperform. I mean, seven carries in week one—that has as enough reason for concern. I think that that bounces back. I don't think that that's going to be the norm. Tags, what do you think there? Do you think that Chris Carson seeing only seven carries is the new normal? Well, it was six. Uh, Chris, Chris, uh, 
It was oh, uh, Carlos right. Hyde that Carlos had seven, Hyde. but either yeah, either yeah, way, seven. I went back and I actually just started research on that game. So uh, Carlos Hyde last year, I said without looking, tell me how many times Chris Carson had less than 15 carries in a game. The answer was two, and one of those games was when he left with his season-ending injury. So it is a little bit worrisome. However, there was only one game last year where he saw more than five targets. So seeing the six targets, it does matter. Uh, Russell Wilson, you know, the whole term, let Russ cook, are they going to let it happen? I think they are. I really do. Yeah. And I'm saying that because he had 31 completions last week. He threw the ball 35 times. He completed it 31, which is stupid. So ridiculous. ridiculous. So the 35 pass attempts doesn't look like huge in the grand scheme of things. But when you look at 31 completions, there was just one game last year where he totaled that number. And it was in a close game against the Saints. And it was somewhat of a shootout. The Falcons were behind that entire game. So Russell Wilson, I do think they are going to let him cook, as they say. So I am a little concerned about uh, Carson. I'm excited about his passing game prospects, um, but it is a little worrisome. Um, it is for sure, especially knowing that New England, the one thing that I am I do think they do well is, is hold running backs in check, whereas like that back end of that defense, you know, with Patrick Chung and stuff like that, is that going to that, – that might affect the wide receivers a little bit more. For sure. All right. So the guy that I'm going to bring up here is my sit is Raheem Mostert. Raheem Mostert at RB17 right now in half PPR ECR. He goes up against the Jets defense. And this Jets defense just held Zach Moss and Devin Singletary in check. And now granted, Raheem Mostert comes with the enormous potential that he can break off one run. And I mean, he was flying on that uh, catch and run. Like, I think he obliterated like Matt Breida's record, like as far as miles per hour, like he was just flying so i think he absolutely has the potential but this is looking at the 49ers are a, are going to be able to win through the air in this game now granted we can say okay who are the wide receivers that he's going to be throwing to but i think no matter who it is i think we just saw josh allen go ham throw over 300 yards on this defense and keep the running backs in check so i think that they're going to lean more a little bit more on the wide receivers and the pass catching backs in this game Tevin Coleman came into this game with the concerns of is he going to play based on the uh, the air condition in uh, in San Francisco. So you don't have that now. I think we see Tevin Coleman's involvement jump up a little bit. Raheem Mostert saw four or five targets in this game, which wasn't normal, wasn't how he was utilized last year. So I'm just saying if there is one player that I have to identify, I'm not going to be willing to start Raheem Mostert over a David Montgomery, right? Maybe even not over a Latavius Murray. That's closer, but I'm just saying like Raheem Mostert to be as a top uh, in the top 17, that's a little bit concerning. And if I had to identify one player, Raheem Mostert would be the guy. All right, let's move over to the wide receivers tags. Who is a wide receiver within the top 30 that you're saying sit if you can? I just want to say Raheem Mostert. I wanted to touch on that that, that next-gen stat that you had, or basically his speed is miles an hour. Yeah. I, I just checked it while you were talking. And Mostert, 22.7 miles per hour. The only player in the five years that they've actually tracked this faster than Raheem Mostert was Tyreek Hill back in 2016. Goodness gracious. Yeah, that's crazy, right? <laughs> yeah, um, my... My set of the week at wide receiver, I think it's probably got to be Will Fuller. Um, there's so many factors going into last week in terms of why he got the air yards he did, the targets that he did and all that. But then you look at Odell Beckham last week and find out that he had 10 targets but caught three of them for 22 yards. Now, granted, his quarterback play was horrendous, and it's not on Beckham per se for that whole entire thing. But this cornerback duo uh, between Marcus Peters and, and Marlon Humphrey, it's just – it's difficult to get things done against them. Uh, since the start of 2019, that duo has allowed just 6.32 yards per target in their coverage. So I am worried about Will Fuller. Uh, I, I think it's difficult to bench him considering the target share and air, air, like the air yards he had from Deshaun Watson. But I do worry that there's bust potential there this week. I think that's fair. I think that's fair. I mean, 12 targets is hard to ignore, but yet Brandon Cooks should be more healthy mm -hmm. with a full you know, week and a half off. So that could potentially play into it too. Um, and again, a stout cornerback unit. So, all right, Eric, let's go to you. Who is a wide receiver within the top 30 that you're saying avoid if you can? Yeah, I would say uh, Tags and I uh, are aligned because uh, Will Fuller was someone that uh, that came to mind as well because just the Ravens, you know, secondary, you know, they're a lot tougher than – you know, than many think. Uh, and, and wide receivers haven't fared well from a fantasy perspective uh, there. And, and if I'm just watching, you know, film and kind of breaking it down, you know, I'm looking at a Texans team for where you know, you've got Will Fuller and David Johnson, where they were responsible for around 60%, you know, of their offensive yards. And so if I'm going to get beat or go down, I'm going to have it be by someone else besides Will Fuller. So I think if you combine all these different factors, I'm like, he's a guy for where I'm like, you know, you, 
you may not meet expectations. Um, just to th- kind of throw another name that's out there. I know we talked about Jamison Crowder uh, a few minutes ago. I know he's he's really someone that I do have some concerns about, you know, just given how Sam Darnold struggled mightily in week one. I'm like, this is a guy yeah. that only completed, you know, one of six passes targeted 15 yards or more downfield, you know, according to Pro Football Focus. And, you know, Crowder was obviously able to benefit. You know, he caught seven out of 13 targets and uh, had a monster fantasy day. You know, he dominated from the slot. But I'd just be very surprised, you know, again, if I'm the 49ers and I'm on defense, you know, very prideful defense, then I'm going to allow Jamison Crowder to run wild. Uh, just especially right. considering, you know, some of the injuries and things they've dealt with. You know, we mentioned Denzel Mims on IR, you know, Rashad Behrman, the Perriman's been banged up. And so it's just going to take someone else to beat them. So Crowder is, is one guy I do have some concerns about. It's very fair. Yeah. And for me, like I mentioned earlier, I'm not con- ranking with Jamison Crowder saying like he's someone that I'm excited about. I'm not ranking him within the top 15 or anything like that, but mm-hmm. saying that he's definitely someone that you should be looking at. But the concerns are there for sure. Okay, um, for me, the wide receiver that I'm identifying here as a potential sit, T.Y. Hilton. T.Y. Hilton all the way up at 19 in ECR, uh, in ECR, excuse me, right now. So I don't know why T.Y. Hilton is all the way up there based on what we saw in week one for us to feel confident ranking him above someone like Odell Beckham, D.K. Metcalf, Marquise Brown, even Michael Gallup. Like these other guys, I don't, I don't get it. Yes, the matchup is potentially like juicy you know with what we saw uh green bay do to minnesota but let's not pretend that aaron Rodgers and philip rivers are even on the same planet right now as far as what they can do so i think that in this matchup indianapolis is going to get back to the ground game they're going to run jonathan taylor into the ground rely on naheem hines i paris campbell of course is still going to be heavily targeted i just don't see the work there for ty hilton to jump up into the top 20 or to be at least ranked there so i'm saying if you can sit ty hilton i would absolutely be looking to do that tags do you agree with that i actually think that if there's one week where i if if ty hilton is going to be fantasy relevant this year this is the week i mean if if you if you can't play him in this matchup i don't know if you can uh basically you look at the the packers wide receiver core not just Devontae adams all of them combined for 315 yards and four touchdowns on 27 targets uh this is a brand new trio of cornerbacks that they're rolling out there and none of them are particularly above average including two rookies depending on you know how many wide receiver sets you're in because the Colts do run some four wide receiver sets. So um, it's tough, man. I, I I think if you have T.Y. Hilton, I'm okay playing him with it as a wide receiver three. I'm not willing to put him in my top 20 wide receivers, but it's more about right. if you can play him at any point, I think it's this matchup. That makes sense. All right, guys, let's move over to the quarterback position here. Tags will go to you and then Eric, uh, quarterback in the top 10 that you're saying sit if you can. I feel gross saying this because I, I, I hate betting against Deshaun Watson. I really do. Um, but you look at this matchup and you're just like, I don't know where it comes from. I, I, I just don't get it. Uh, they don't have that. He doesn't have that guy anymore that he can go to in the offense. And if I'm worried about Will Fuller, it's like, okay, what's going to happen here? Brandon Cook's still dealing with that injury coming back. Him and Kenny Stills are splitting snaps. Randall Cobb is not an explosive playmaker. He's not Tyreek Hill over the middle of the field. Um, last year with DeAndre Hopkins, on his team against the Ravens, he completed just 18 of 29 passes for 169 yards, no touchdowns, and one interception. Um, by the way, the Ravens, this is where it's like, I always hate fading Watson because of what they, you know, what he can do with his legs. But <clears throat> the Ravens, do you know how many fantasy points they've allowed on the ground to quarterbacks since the start of last season? 19.5 fantasy points on the ground. That is it. Like Deshaun Watson wow. played them. He had 12 rushing yards. So I, I just don't feel great about Watson this week. I'm not going to move him out of my top 12 because I just can't do that. But right. if you have another option that you're considering, like an Aaron Rodgers, I would play Rodgers over him. Um, looking at some other quarterbacks, I would play Tom Brady over him, Russell Wilson, Cam Newton. I would play those guys over him. The whole thing with Deshaun Watson was, yes, he in the offseason was, yes, he lost DeAndre Hopkins, but yet this could lead to even more scrambling potential, mm-hmm. right? And those easy, you know, rushing yards. Well, yeah, with that stat of this this Baltimore Ravens defense not giving that up, and especially this is a stout cornerback unit. I really like the corners that they've got. Yep. They should be able to keep these guys somewhat in check. Um, so, yeah, it's just not something that... 
again, I'm with you, Tags. I'm not putting him outside my top 12, but I'm not super excited about starting right. him. Eric, what about you? Who is a guy, a quarterback? Is it Deshaun Watson or is it someone else in the top 10 that you're saying, I might be looking somewhere else? You know, I'm kind of I'm kind of chuckling in a way where, where Tags is doing his breakdown. I was like, Tags, were you like in my head? I'm like, you're, you're like taking, <laughs> taking all my guys. I'm like, he must have that, that birthday... <laughs> I don't know, just connection. Something's <laughs> going on. Happy birthday, by the way. But um, Thanks, man. I would say, <laughs> let me think for a brief moment. I do agree what Tag said about uh, about Deshaun Watson. Now, someone else that, that I'm, I'm kind of struggling with, and I'm trying to figure out where I'm going to rank him for the week, is uh, is Drew Brees. Uh, I'm a longtime Saints fan. Um, you know, grew up, you know, about two hours outside of um, uh, New Orleans. So been watching the Saints for, for decades. And so he, he just did not look right to me um, in week one. You know, I saw some passes for where they were kind of floating up there uh, a little bit more than we have seen in the past. So perhaps age is catching up with them. So you know, he may be someone that may not even finish potentially as a QB1 this week just because they lean more on the running game and the short passing game. So I'll just kind of put that out there since uh, Tags took Deshaun Watson from me. <laughs> well, I don't know what the heck we're doing here, guys, because, Eric, you stole my guy. So we're just continuing the chain here. Uh, yeah, you took I, you took Drew Brees from me. So Drew Brees was someone that I was talking about or I was going to talk about for a lot of the same reasons. I'm a lot of the same reasons that I mentioned Latavius Murray, right? Latavius Murray is someone because they're going to lean more on this ground game. The whole thing with Drew Brees uh, is that he's had Michael Thomas, who just consistently racks up the yardage for him and makes it life easy on him. Well, he doesn't have him anymore. So, and a lot of the same things, I saw a lot of the same things that you did, Eric, where this ball didn't look like it had the same zip on it that uh, it did in previous seasons with Drew Brees. I'm a little concerned. So for him to be at number 10 in ECR right now, I'm saying I'm probably going to be looking elsewhere. Again, for example, if it's a choice between Drew Brees and Cam Newton, I'm starting Cam Newton 10 times out of 10. Uh, all right, guys, that is going to do it for the start and sit component. Let's flip the uh, flip the script here a little bit, and let's focus in on the Thursday night preview, okay? So let's talk about Browns and Cincinnati Bengals. we got a barn burner here with two number one overall <laughs> picks going up against each other with Baker Mayfield and Joe Burrow. I am actually excited to watch Same. this game and see if Baker can bounce back from a just horrific performance and then see how Joe Burrow progresses. So... Let's focus in on, I think the biggest question that people will have in this matchup is the Browns and the Browns running backs. Okay, let's talk about them. Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt. What can we expect, Tags, from Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt in this game? Are either of these guys going to finish as top 15 options? Because what we saw from Nick Chubb last week wasn't fantastic. I think Chubb's top 10 this week. Uh, I know a lot of people are worried about him and saying that it's more of a 50-50 split. I don't think that's the case. Uh, if you look at um, the the, uh, the first half when the game was still in, within reach, uh, close to within reach, Chubb had played 21 snaps, Hunt had played 11. Um, and it also should be noted that Chubb totaled 48 of his 68 or of his 66 yards in the first 12 minutes of the game. So he came out, he, guns blazing and all that stuff, but then they went to, they had to drop back and pass a lot more. Uh, Kareem Hunt's the guy that's going to be on the field in that role. They are big favorites in this game, and I don't know why. Uh, it's one of those right. things where you wonder, is Vegas, do, like, the, do odds makers know something that we don't? Uh, because I see no reason that the Browns should be favored by six in this game. I thought it might be Cleveland by three, three and a half. Um, but by six, that tells me, again, Cleveland's at home. You have a running back who, in positive game scripts, you're not worried about much. Kareem Hunt, this could be a multiple touchdown game for him against the Bengals, who are, you know, they have a lot of defense. They've changed a lot on their defense. They have an entirely new linebacking core. They added DJ Reader to the defensive line. Um, there's a lot of reasons that the Bengals could be better, but Nick Chubb is still the guy in this backfield that uh, in positive game scripts and based on odds makers, what they're saying, Chubb will be. The, I, I just believe that Chubb is going to be a top 10 running back play this week, and I'm willing to forgive him for last week. Eric, what are your thoughts there with those running backs before we move on to the Browns wide receivers? Yeah, as far as with uh, Chubb and Hunt, uh, you know, the dynamic duo, uh, I do believe that the Browns will have to lean even more on both of them. There's going to be enough food in the buffet for both to eat, you know, just given how Baker Mayfield performed against the Ravens in week one. Like you're looking at someone that looked rattled and, and uncomfortable against Baltimore's defense. And, you know, his stat line and other advanced metrics uh, support it. But one thing I always think about with Hunt and Chubb is that, you know, Hunt is the guy that got the two-year, you know, $13 million contract extension. So whenever you put dollars and cents on the line, I'm like, that's that's going to be someone that's going to get some opportunities. And so I do like, uh, I do like both of them. Uh, I do see it being more 
kind of a 50 50 you know committee because you know hunts demonstrated the ability to run successfully in between the tackles like he did in kansas city uh during his rookie right. season and so uh, i just think it's going to be enough uh enough food for both to, to get fed uh so it may be a 50 50 split but i think both have a legitimate you know opportunity to finish as the rb2s are better Let's look at the wide receivers for the Browns, or the receivers in general, excuse me. So for the Browns, Odell Beckham Jr. tags, you mentioned that Baker just missed him on a couple of big plays mm-hmm. here or there that could have absolutely you know, changed confidence. I saw a lot of people in a lot of home leagues saying that Baker, or not Baker, uh, Odell Beckham was dropped in their leagues. People are just like out on OBJ this year, and I just... I don't think that's smart based on what you were saying, Tags, that he just missed him on a couple of big plays that could have absolutely made, uh, you know, turned him into a wide receiver one for fantasy. So let's just give a quick outlook here, uh, just run through these tags of OBJ, Jarvis Landry, he is reportedly going to play, and then Austin Hooper, David Njoku on IR. Mm -hmm. So this opens things up here for Austin Hooper. He's a sneaky play in my eyes. Yeah, Beckham is a wide receiver two for me. I don't want to rely on him as anything more than that uh, because obviously with Mayfield struggles, but this is a team that he saw six targets against last year turn them into 81 yards and a touchdown um I, I do like Beckham this week I, I, he does well in prime time too the guy loves the stage he's he is a he is a me 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 guy and that's what a lot of receivers are uh but I do like Beckham here um I think Mayfield's similar actually I think he likes playing on a big stage so um as for Landry he missed some practice time uh with his hip injury they talked about him being on a potentially limited snap count that's obviously worrisome I'm moving him down my ranks Tyler Boyd I'm not so worried about uh it's not it's not a bad matchup for him against this this Browns defense. The Browns really struggling at safety, linebacker. Um, obviously, that trickles down sometimes into someone like Tyler Boyd, where if they move him into the slot, they don't have three cornerbacks on the field, whatever the position may be. Uh, Tyler Boyd, I think he's fine as a wide receiver three. I'd play Tyler Boyd over Jarvis Landry, considering all this. And uh, A.J. Green should absolutely be in your lineups this week um, as a, a low-end wide receiver two at least. Yeah, so let's let's touch on these uh, Bengals wide receivers, Eric. I mean, Tyler Boyd, as uh, Tags mentioned, is someone who absolutely could go off. Uh, looking at PFF's uh, wide receiver and cornerback matchup chart, it looks like Tyler Boyd is going to be matched up in the slot against T- Tavier Thomas. Um, guys, I follow football for a living. I don't know who Tavier Thomas is. Uh, probably butchering his name. So I like I have no idea who this guy is. So um, that and it's showing that this is a favorable matchup. I like Tyler Boyd. Denzel Ward. Here's the interesting part, and I tweeted this out earlier today. Denzel Ward does not shadow. Denzel Ward stays on one side of the field, and that's the side of the field that John Ross plays on. So AJ Green lining up against Terrence Mitchell in this matchup. Do you like AJ Green and Tyler Boyd in this matchup, Eric? And what are their ceilings? Yeah, I, I do like uh, I do like both of them uh, in the matchup. Uh, you brought up some really good points, uh, Kyle, about um, you know who they'll be matched up against. It's almost like the you know the big trouble in Little China. You know Jack Burton. You know who Jack Burton? Me. You know that type of scenario. <laughs> um, but one one thing I think about is with with Burrow, uh, rookie quarterback. I'm like he didn't have obviously the you know, the greatest game. And then the Bengals offensive line you know, continues to be a problem. You know, they surrendered uh, three sacks. You know, when I was just watching, you know, Burrow obviously struggled uh, under pressure. You know, he's obviously going to continue to develop as an NFL quarterback. So I would say with, uh, as far as like a ceiling, you know, to answer your question, um, you know, I would see A.J. Green ceiling, you know, high-end wide receiver two. And I would actually go the, you know, go the same route with, um, with Tyler Boyd. Because you know, I think they'll both get a fair amount of targets. I just see the Bengals leaning more on the running game and, and Joe Mixon just to get Burrow comfortable. Because he, again, another quarterback that didn't look entirely comfortable to me right. when, when watching the game. But yeah, that, that's kind of my take. Yeah, let's. Yeah, no, I'm glad you mentioned Joe Mixon because I want to touch on him super quick. Tags, 19 carries last week. Obviously, had the fumble, so it didn't help matters when he didn't get any, essentially, any work throughout the air, uh, through the air, and then didn't score either. So, should fantasy owners feel comfortable plugging Joe Mixon back into their lineup for this Thursday night matchup? Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, the 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 uh, the Browns allowed 260 fantasy points to on the ground last year, which was the sixth most in, in the league. Which obviously benefits Mixon's role as he's not heavily as heavily as we want him to be involved in the passing game. Uh, and they obviously replaced all their linebackers this offseason. Joe Schobert, Christian Kirksey, Adarius Taylor; those guys are all gone. They lost Mac Wilson, one of the other linebackers that was supposed to take over. They lost their starting safety that basic that during training camp that they drafted to play a role in the second round. There's just there's problems all over the place for the Browns. Uh, the only strength 
strength they have is their pass rush. So if they can slow that down at Burrow, like they can only bring so many guys when you have them going three wide with John Ross, AJ Green, and Tyler Boyd. There's a lot of problems they present there. So they, in the end, Mixon needs the offensive line to play better because they were horrendous in Burrow's first start. But it'll take time because there's a couple new pieces on there. Uh, but start Mixon. Don't we? Don't worry about it. All right. Well, guys, I think that is going to do it for the Thursday night preview. Again, I mentioned we didn't touch, and I'm super. Uh, or a lot there, excuse me, but Austin Hooper is someone that I do like in this matchup. Again, with David Njoku missing, I do have Austin Hooper inside my top 10 at the tight end position this week, guys, so I like him in this matchup. All right, guys, tags, before we get out of here, any final words before we uh, before we end here? Oh, no, embrace the madness. I mean, that's that's all we can do, right? It's The, the NFL's back. I, don't, I really don't even care if my fantasy team's won. I care that the NFL's back. We're watching it on Sundays, and that, well, that puts me in a good mood. For sure. And it, you're, it's again, it's your birthday, so you should be in a good mood altogether. Uh, hey, a huge thank you to Eric Moody for coming on and chatting some football with us. Uh, man, thank you so much for joining us. No, no, I, I appreciate the invite. You know, it, it was fun. It was a blast. I would definitely have to do this again. And uh, tags, you know, happy birthday, my friend. I think this is the first time we've actually been able to speak kind of using our voices. <laughs> I know we've like direct message each other and everything on Twitter. For uh, sure. Same thing with you, Kyle. So it's a pleasure to actually have a chance to uh, chat about football with you. Thanks again. It was fun. It was fun, man. Absolutely. Don't forget to go find and follow him on Twitter at Eric and Moody. Guys, we'll be back tomorrow with another episode for Mike Taglier and Eric Moody. I'm Kyle Yates, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning into the Fantasy Pros YouTube channel. Make sure to check out our featured videos as well. Also, make sure to click that red subscribe button to get notified when we post videos in the future.